Welcome to another edition of Unfettered Freedom, your bi-weekly GNU slash Linux news video podcast. Packing so much freedom into each episode, it ought to be illegal. There's so much freedom packed into this podcast that those little hairs growing around my neck, I'm thinking about letting them grow out. On this episode of Unfettered Freedom, we're going to talk about the Free Software Foundation and their high-priority project list. They're asking for community feedback on what should be changed on their high-priority project list. We're also going to talk about a new ransomware threat. Well, new for Linux, but it was on Windows. Now it's jumped from Windows to Linux. A lot of Linux users think we don't have to worry about ransomware. That's not actually the case. Also, what are the best GNU slash Linux distributions of 2020? I'm going to share with you one author's list of his best of 2020, and I may give you some of my feedback as well. GIMP is pushing towards version 3.0. They just recently released a development version, version 2.99.2, and it comes with a ton of cool new features. Also, Is a code of conduct really necessary? Is there any code of conduct out there that's actually sane and written for adults? I'm going to show you one. All of this on episode 11 of Unfettered Freedom. I am your host, Derek Taylor, also known as DT or DistroTube on YouTube and on Library. This podcast, as well as all of the video content on the DistroTube channel, is community-sponsored. Because of the community's support that I receive, there are no corporate sponsors or product shilling of any kind in these episodes. And if you'd like to support my work, I'd greatly appreciate it. Please consider subscribing to DistroTube over on Patreon. And the first topic today is the high priority project list over at the Free Software Foundation. So the high priority project list is a list of projects, of course, that the Free Software Foundation deems as having great strategic importance as far as the goal of freedom for all computer users. It's all about freedom, right? It's all about uh, free software and digital rights and digital privacy and things like that. And a few years ago, they created this committee to oversee the high priority project list. And Right now, what they're asking is they want to overhaul the current list and they're asking for community feedback as far as what should actually be on the list and you know what should take priority, of course, on the high priority project list. And currently, if I go to the high priority project list page here, you will see some of the things listed. Some of the areas of focus include things like developing a free operating system for the phone, a phone operating system that's fully free as in freedom. Now, you might argue that we already have several of these, and we kind of already do, right? Maybe not completely free as in freedom, Uh, certainly if we're talking about open source projects. So, I mean, we have things like uh, the Pine Phone, we have uh, the Ubuntu Touch, and there are various free as in freedom Android-like operating systems out there as well, but I guess they don't quite meet the definition of free software according to the Free Software Foundation, so they're really pushing for a fully free phone operating system. The second area of focus listed here is probably the one that I think is the biggest as far as one of the most important things we need to focus on as a community, and that is pushing decentralization, federation, and self-hosting. Uh, Especially decentralization, I think, is a very big deal because too much of the Internet has become centralized, right? There's like 99% of the web is basically controlled by the same four or five companies, and I don't like that. I, I, I doubt many of you guys like that. And for me, I love using decentralized services and platforms and social networks, things like Mastodon, for example. It's a federated, decentralized Twitter alternative, and it's fantastic. It's free and open source software, and anybody can start their own Mastodon instance. And if you get banned from one Mastodon instance, well, just go to another or create your own, and you can set up your own rules for your Mastodon. It's not like Twitter, where there's one Twitter, one set of Twitter's rules, and if you break it, they ban you, they kick you off the platform, they can censor you. You, know, you don't have any of that when you deal with decentralized software. 
Also on the high priority project list include the push for free drivers, free firmware, hardware designs as far as free hardware. So not just the free software foundation, but they also want to push free hardware as well. And this is a noble goal. Now, they have always been pushing hard for free drivers. And these kinds of projects have been on the high priority project list probably since the beginning, the free driver calls and the free firmware calls. And, uh, it really hasn't amounted to much, unfortunately, because a lot of this is dependent on the hardware itself. And until you get people that are actually creating, you know, free hardware, open hardware, you know, you're going to have problems getting people to also develop free drivers for their hardware if that hardware is also not free. The next thing on the list is one that makes a whole lot of sense and one that the Free Software Foundation has really focused on because of the COVID pandemic. And that is we need free real time voice and video chat options because people right now are using things like Skype and FaceTime and Zoom and Discord and, you know, all of these proprietary video conferencing platforms that are not necessarily freedom respecting. Matter of fact, all of the ones I just named are actually licensed under proprietary license. You can't really uh, audit the source code. You really don't know what those services are doing to you. You don't know what kind of information they're data mining you for and what they're doing with that information. I know that the Free Software Foundation here in the last few months has really been pushing people toward some of the free video chat platforms and things including like Jitsi and the Big Blue Button. So I'm pretty sure that's probably where they're going with that. The next thing is encouraging contributions by people underrepresented in the community. So they're talking about people that maybe have been disenfranchised in some way and they want to bring some of those people into the fold as far as the free software community. And just briefly, some of the other things that they're mentioning, they want to focus on accessibility, uh, internationalization. So they, they want the free software movement to be more than just an American thing and a European thing. They really want, especially in areas like South America and Africa and Asia, to get more people involved in free software to start spreading that message. They also want to focus, of course, on security. They also would like people to focus on maybe developing intelligent personal assistance. So things like Apple, Siri, Google Now, Cortana, the Amazon Echo, and the list goes on and on. Now they want people to get away from those services because those services especially are extremely dangerous because you're basically, you've bugged your own house when you have a device that's always listening for your commands. And because that's not free software, you don't know what these things are doing to you. So if people need to use these things, we really need a free as in freedom alternative to things like Siri and the Amazon Echo. And finally, one of the things they, of course, want to push is they want to push more GNU slash Linux distributions that are 100% committed to freedom. So we're talking about the FSF approved distros. So we're talking about distros like Geeks and Parabola and Triskel, the ones that actually use the Linux Libre kernel, the kernel that's got all the proprietary blobs stripped out of it. And, you know, it's 100% free software and the FSF wants more of those and those that are actually 100% free. The FSF wants to spend more time promoting those distributions to hopefully make them rise in popularity because the more people that use the free distributions, the better those distributions become. And maybe eventually we can start weaning ourselves off of some of the proprietary bits that are in 99% of our GNU slash Linux distributions. For those of you that want to give your feedback on the high priority project list, you know, what is important to you, they do list an email address here on this latest blog post here. The email address is hpp-feedback at canoe.org, and they ask you to email your suggested changes by January 8th of 2021. And our second story is a new ransomware threat on Linux. And it's new to Linux, but it's been around previously, this particular piece of ransomware, but it was previously on Windows. Now it's jumped over to Linux. And increasingly, ransomware is becoming more and more prevalent on Linux. And we really need to be aware of this and we need to not be so complacent. A lot of Linux users, especially when it comes to security, we think we're so much better than 
Windows and Mac and many of the mobile operating systems as well. You know, we don't have to worry about this thing. We don't have to worry about ransomware. It's never going to touch us, especially Linux desktop users. And that's not necessarily the case. For those of you watching the video portion of the podcast, I'm showing you guys a article from Forbes. This article was written by Davey Winder, and he talks about how ransomware has really plagued Windows users for years, and that's true. Uh, if you run Windows, you know about ransomware. It's plagued Windows since the beginning of time. Well, at least since the beginning of the web, for sure. And I've got to share a story here. The reason I run Linux as my daily desktop driver is because of Windows ransomware. So I've been a full-time Linux desktop user for about 12 or 13 years now. And the reason is because the version of Windows I ran at the time, Windows XP, was taken over by some ransomware. My computer was held hostage by this hacker and I had to pay a ransom for him to give me the quote antivirus <laughs> that would get rid of the ransomware. And of course, I'm not going to pay a terrorist, <laughs> you know, this, this hacker that put this ransomware on my machine. No, no, no. What I did was I formatted the hard drive and I was so mad, <laughs> formatted the hard drive and I installed whatever version of Ubuntu was around at that time. And I never looked back. I've been a Windows user since that day. And, you know, it's one of those things that's just incredibly frustrating. There is nothing more frustrating than ransomware because you know that your machine didn't just break because of an update or something dumb you did. You know, it's this guy basically holding your machine hostage and wanting you to actually pay him to release your machine. And it's just a really sick kind of attack. What's unfortunate about ransomware, it is extremely profitable for the people that do it right. Ransomware is such a profitable business. The Ryuk threat that happened a little while back is said to have made $34 million from just one successful attack. They were targeting, I think, business enterprise at the time. And that's really what ransomware, they're typically not after you or me, although there's a lot of that too, but the ones that are in it for the big bucks, they target large corporations and governments, right? They, they want to infect their machines. They want to take over their machines. They want to steal their data. And hey, if you want it back, pay us this money. And apparently Ryuk, the people behind that particular threat, made $34 million in one attack. So I don't know if they did multiple attacks or not, but in one attack, they made $34 million. One of the highest profile um, ransomware operations is the group behind R Evil. There's an R Evil cyber criminal group, and they have allegedly made more than $100 million a year from extorting ransom payments through the ransomware that they're spreading. So that is just incredible amounts of money. And it really makes ransomware probably the most prominent cybersecurity threat that we face today. What's really crazy is that so many governments and big businesses, big corporations actually do pay the ransom. So these cyber criminals, they're trying to extort this money uh, because they have your data and want to give it back to you. Or in some cases, they find scandalous information on these machines. Right. And we're going to give it to the public. You know, this confidential data that we stole, you know what, you better pay us or this crazy stuff we found on your computer. We're going to release it. And many people do actually pay that ransom, that extortion money. And that's dangerous to do for a number of reasons. Mainly, you can't guarantee that the person behind that ransomware attack is actually going to give you your data back just because you pay them. It's, it's dicey either way, but sometimes corporations and governments have no choice. Like if it's critical stuff that was taken and it's going to cause massive amounts of problems for you, sometimes it's better just to take a chance and pay those guys and, and hope they give you that data back. But oftentimes it, it's simply you're rolling the dice on that. You, you really can't be sure that they're going to give you that data back. Now, we have seen ransomware attacks targeted for Linux machines. A while back, I talked about a, a cyber threat called DrovoRub, which was, I, I believe, a Russian uh, hack that was a piece of ransomware. So we do see these kinds of things on Linux. The latest one, though, is called Ransom EXX. And what this is, it, was, it used to be a prevalent Windows attack. So they saw this attack all the time on Windows. It has since been ported over to Linux and specifically ported to Linux. I'm like, it's a very specific piece of ransomware. 
uh, and it actually is so specific, they actually target specific Linux users with these ransomware attacks, which is typical. Like the big players in ransomware, they typically go after specific people, specific corporations, the ones they know have deep pockets. So how do you go about mitigating the threat? Well, it's, it's standard no matter whether you run Windows or Linux or what operating system you run. You have to do the basic security stuff. You have to get the basics right. And that usually means addressing the human factor because that's how a lot of people get into these machines is a, a real life human being drop the ball somewhere. So some of the things, especially in business enterprise, you got to get right. You know, really, you got to make sure you have multiple intrusion prevention layers, things like spam filtering to DNS protection. You know, that, that kind of makes sense. Also, passwords, password management. Uh, that's, you know, once you start letting people in just a little bit, so they guess your very simple password to one employee's machine. Sometimes that's all that takes to really get things snowballing and to the point where they have complete access to your system and they can put that ransomware in and then that entire company is completely hosed. The next topic I want to talk about is uh, the topic of the best GNU slash Linux distributions of 2020 because I'm starting to see a lot of written content about this and a lot of video content. Everybody's coming out with their videos of the best Linux distributions of 2020. The articles are writing the best Linux distributions of 2020. And the reason is because 2020 is about over, right? We only have another, what, five, six weeks left of 2020. And most of the big Linux releases have already happened, right? So uh, especially the really big players in Linux have already done one or even two huge releases already this year. And we're not going to see any other really big releases, I, I wouldn't think, in the next six weeks. So everybody's making their top five, top ten list. And one such article I came across is over at Tech Republic. The article is by Jack Wallen, and he lays out his, I think, his top five distributions of 2020. And I believe he's focusing strictly on desktop Linux, which is fine because I'm simply a Linux desktop user as well. And you get into the server space, I don't know anything about uh, Linux servers. You know, I don't work as a sysadmin or anything like that. But if you talk about Linux on the desktop, I may have something to say. So let's check out his best Linux distributions for 2020. And oddly enough, he starts out with Ubuntu 2010. Now I say oddly enough because Ubuntu 2010 is an interim release for Ubuntu. Now, Ubuntu 2004 that happened in April of 2020 was an LTS release, and that's typically one that everybody runs. They Everybody that runs Ubuntu typically runs the LTS releases. Nobody really runs the interim releases because they're only supported for up to nine months. You have to move to the next version anyway, where the LTS releases are supported for many, many years, up to five years, actually up to 10 years now, I think, with some extended support contracts. But uh, that seems strange that he went with Ubuntu 2010 rather than 2004 on his list. But hey, uh, I do think Ubuntu 2010 was a solid release. I did take a look at both Ubuntu 2004 and 2010 on the YouTube channel, and I thought they were solid releases. I thought both distributions had a really nice look. They both look clean, polished, and look professional, as you would expect, because, of course, Ubuntu is supported by a large corporation, Canonical. And uh, Jack here, he, he talks about why he went with 2010 over 2004, and he says it was strictly because he likes GNOME 3.38 more than, I guess, the previous version of GNOME. So if, if it comes down to what you like about GNOME, I guess that's why he went with uh, Ubuntu 2010. I'm not a GNOME fan either way. So I probably would prefer the base system of 2004 being a long-term support release. His second top distribution of 2020 was Pop! OS 2010. Now, I personally have not taken a look at Pop! OS 2010, but every time I have taken a look at any version of Pop! OS, I do admit it is a very well put together distribution. Pop! OS is from the guys over at System76. You guys know the Linux computer manufacturer System76. They put out great desktops, laptops, they even do servers. And the System76 guys have their own custom Linux distribution called Pop! OS. It's based on Ubuntu. It uses the GNOME desktop and it has a lot of good hardware support, especially for those of you running System76 hardware. That's probably the distribution you want to try first. 
his third top distribution of 2020 is one that's not a surprise to me, Fedora 33. Fedora 33, I actually did download the ISO for Fedora 33. I didn't do anything with it on camera, but it is a solid release. I actually downloaded Fedora 33, their KDE ISO, and took it for a spin. And it's not bad. I didn't take a look at the uh, traditional, the mainstream Fedora 33 release, which of course comes with the GNOME desktop. But kind of like Ubuntu 2010, Fedora 33 comes with GNOME 3.38. And if you're a fan of GNOME, you probably are going to love GNOME 3.38. It's definitely an improvement on some of the previous editions of GNOME. His fourth top Linux distribution of 2020 is MX Linux, and he specifies the KDE spin. Now that is interesting because the flagship edition of MX has the XFCE desktop. And I actually install MX Linux a lot, like on friends and family computers. That's typically one I keep an ISO of as far I keep a USB stick of MX. And I throw the, the main edition of MX on a lot of machines with the XFCE desktop, with that weird bar on the side that's got the stuff at the bottom. <laughs> it's kind of laid out a little differently, but it's not bad. And typically the people that I put MX on their machines, they love it. They never have any issues it's rock solid stable of course it's based on debian so you would expect it to be stable the author here has stated that he decided to go with mx kde on the list rather than the standard mx linux is because kde and xfce really don't have much difference as far as performance anymore as far as system resource usage he says he really didn't see any benefit of going with xfce when kde plasma really doesn't use any more system resources than XFCE, and it's a more fleshed out desktop environment, which I can understand. I actually can respect that opinion. I'm not sure if I completely agree with that, because XFCE is a little slimmer than Plasma, but probably not much. But I think both of them are great desktop environments. So, you know, pick and choose whichever one you want. I think the base system, MX Linux, I think is a fantastic distribution. And rounding out his five best Linux distributions of 2020 is Manjaro. Manjaro, of course, is an Arch-based Linux distribution, and I've run Manjaro a lot over the last few years. And I think as a fantastic distribution, Manjaro, their flagship edition, is an XFCE edition, and they do one of the best XFCE desktop environments you'll ever see. I've also played a little bit with Manjaro's KDE edition, and it's... A really good looking KDE desktop. Manjaro, all their desktop environments, you know, they really spend a lot of time customizing them and making them look good and clean and polished. For those of us that like more minimal desktops, I will say that some of their window manager only spins, things like i3, Awesome, BSPWM, Openbox, and they make pretty good editions of all of those. And one really stands out to me. Their i3 edition is probably the best i3 configured out of the box of any Linux distribution as far as the programs and the theming and everything. If you really are looking for an easy way to get into tiling window managers, maybe you've never run a tiling window manager and this is your first time checking one out, maybe check out Manjaro i3 edition. I think you will be really impressed with that particular distribution. Now, of course, do I agree with his list? I think his list is respectable. Uh, the only thing that kind of surprised me is he did not have any release of Linux Mint on the list because Linux Mint did release, what, version 20 in, in 2020, and I actually did take a look at that on the channel. And if you're talking about, you know, just standard desktop GNU slash Linux distributions, I think you probably had to find room for Linux Mint 20 somewhere on the list. Now, for me, would these be my top five GNU slash Linux distributions of 2020? Well, if you're talking about stuff that I would run... Personally, no, I would probably have a completely different best GNU slash Linux distributions of 2020. And I might do a video on that in the coming days or coming weeks, because I think that would be interesting. You know, I'm not going to try to pick distributions I think are for everybody, but just strictly for me. Yeah, I, I might do that because I've taken a look, of course, at a lot of distributions here in the last year in 2020. And, and some of them really impressed me. Some of them impressed me that going into them, I didn't think would impress me, you know, like it really changed my mind. Like, I don't know if I would ever run this dist distribution and then I check it out and I'm like, man, I might throw that on one of my laptops, you know, so oh, check out that video coming uh, probably in the next couple of weeks. I'll probably get to DT's personal top five of 2020 or whatever I decide to title that video.
And the fourth story is going to be the development version of GIMP 2.99.2. So this is a development release for GIMP. It's a beta release, basically. And why is that important? Who cares about a development release? Because this development release of GIMP has a ton of new features in it. It's really a preview for those of you wondering what's coming down the pipe when GIMP finally releases version 3.0. Now, I have not installed the development version of GIMP, GIMP 2.99.2 yet, but I may, uh, if it seems stable enough, I, I use GIMP a lot, so I don't want anything that's a complete crash fest or anything. So I don't know, I may just wait for the official release of GIMP 3.0, but it does come with some interesting features that some of you may need right away. I don't know if I necessarily need some of these, but the big highlights from this is that it will be GTK3 based. So you're going to get the GTK3 based user interface, which is going to give you client side decorations and a lot more client side decorations for the various windows that pop up and everything. Also, you're going to have native support for Wayland and high DPI. So that is huge news for some of you guys. Not Many desktop Linux users, of course, are using Wayland, but those of you that are, especially if you're on something like Fedora and you use Fedora with GNOME with Wayland because they kind of push that. And a lot of you guys are on Wayland. High DPI displays are becoming more and more common, so that's great. They're focusing on that. They've done some major refactoring and cleanup. Now you have multiple layer selection. You have more color space invasion. Render caching available for better performance. There's a new plugin API, and plugins are now possible with Python, JavaScript, Lua, and Vala. So pick your favorite scripting language. You can now make a plugin with it. I think all of that is huge. I, I Really, that is they're just the highlights there. The reading the, of the highlights, those are gigantic improvements for GIMP. If we just spotlight some of those, and they talked about the multi-layer selection. So that's, you know, when you start layering tons and tons of layers on top of each other in GIMP. I don't know if a lot of you guys work with GIMP and work with layers, but when you do, sometimes it's hard to manage all those layers. And now you have the ability to select multiple layers at a time and do things on those multiple selected layers. I think that's awesome. We have the plugin API. And really, that's one of the great things about GIMP is the extensibility. There's a ton of GIMP plugins out there that add different features to GIMP, you know, things that are not there by default. And I think that's a, a great because I pretty much every piece of software, if, at least the stuff I use, I, I love extensible software. I love software that comes out of the box, kind of bare, and then I get to pick and choose exactly what I want, what plugins I want, what extensions I want. And the switch to GTK3 is big because, you know, that lets developers now, they can create new CSS based themes for the editor. And you can take advantage now of light, dark mode, system settings and things like that. By the way, I think there will be a very easy way in GIMP 2.99.2 and beyond where you can now quickly toggle between light and dark modes. So that's pretty important for many users. For those of you wanting to check out this development release of GIMP, you can install it by using a flat pack. So it's available on any Linux distribution that can use flat pack, which is most every GNU slash Linux distribution. And the fifth and final story I want to talk about is really just a topic I wanted to talk about, and that is codes of conduct. Because I've talked about codes of conduct a lot on my YouTube channel and how they're not really something I like. I don't like people feeling the need that they have to insert a code of conduct into their open source project, that they need to somehow regulate people's behavior. I've never thought codes of conduct are really a necessary thing. I think people, as human beings, we know how to treat each other, right? Everybody knows this is the correct way to treat somebody. This is the incorrect way to treat somebody. No one needs to be told in writing, this is the way you should treat somebody. That writing doesn't even matter anyway, as like, because everybody kind of knows how to treat each other anyway. It's kind of pointless to even put this stuff down in writing. And then some of the people that are putting out codes of conduct, like the GNOME project, have these insane codes of conduct that have a lot of divisive political rhetoric and sometimes bigoted language in them. And it's just, there's some disgusting codes of conduct out there. So uh, I was wondering, are there any sane codes of conduct out there? Are there any codes of conduct out there that are actually written and directed toward adults? Because I'm not seeing that many of those kinds of codes of conduct. And I came across one the other day and I wanted to share with you guys. 
I found this code of conduct over on GitHub. It is the NCOC, or the No Code of Conduct. That's right. It is actually called the No Code of Conduct. And if you read the Code of Conduct, if I actually read the Markdown document here, this project adheres to No Code of Conduct. We are all adults. We accept anyone's contributions. Nothing else matters. <laughs> that's, that's the Code of Conduct. And I love it. That's perfect, right? Hey, this project has no code of conduct. We are all adults. We accept anyone's contributions. Nothing else matters. So all that matters is the software, right? If you have something to contribute, we want it. If you don't have anything to contribute, oh well. But other than that, that's all that matters. And I, I think that makes perfect sense. I don't understand. It's basically not having a code of conduct, but if you're going to have one, I like it put that way. I'm just letting people know, hey, if you were here looking for some kind of divisive political rhetoric in a code of conduct, you're not going to find one. We don't have one. We don't care. What do we care about? We care about code. What I love about the no code of conduct is it really only had three kind of principles there. Basically, we're all adults. We accept everyone's contributions. Nothing else matters. <laughs> just three points, right? And I think Every single person on the planet could agree with those three points. And it's, it's just perfect. Now, for those of you that want to implement the no code of conduct on your project, how do you do that? Well, you copy the code of conduct.md here, right? You put it in the root directory of your project. So you have a GitHub or a GitLab repo. Just throw the no code of conduct directly in the root directory of that project. And it's there. Now, just because I think the no code of conduct is very sane and rational doesn't mean everybody in the world. You know, there's a lot of irrational people out there and they do address some points of, hey, what if these irrational people come and say things like, hey, what if this makes me feel discriminated? What if the fact that you don't have a code of conduct because the no code of conduct is basically not a code of conduct? What if I feel discriminated against because you don't have a code of conduct? And the no code of conduct uh, creator here says, well, that's basically your problem simply because we don't babysit people on our site and make sure they treat you with respect. We hope that doesn't mean you feel unwelcome. But if that's the case, hey, bye. <laughs> and I completely agree. Like, that's not the point of, of a free and open source software project is not to sit there and babysit people and make sure they treat each other right and make sure feelings aren't hurt. Right. It's about building whatever project, whatever they're working on. That's what it's about. It's not about making people feel like they're special and, and important. If you have issues with that sort of thing, then you actually need to go see a therapist, right? You don't need to be spending your time uh, with this open source project you're working on anyway. And of course, many people will tell you that not having a code of conduct is the sign of a project not really being serious because you have to have a code of conduct if you're serious because you're going to lose so many talented individuals contributing to your project because they see you don't have a code of conduct. It's probably going to be this toxic and hateful place to work in. That's simply not the case. These codes of conduct are kind of a recent thing. And before codes of conduct, w did we have a problem developing software? No, <laughs> like millions and millions and millions of people have contributed code and documentation and artwork and everything else to open source software projects. And it wasn't because there was a code of conduct. It wasn't because there wasn't a code of con the code of conduct thing is irrelevant. And I don't know why some people just don't get that. Now, in all seriousness, say you do implement the no code of conduct for your project. What if somebody has a problem with another person? Because that's going to happen. Somebody's going to feel like they were treated unfairly or they were discriminated against or, you know, somebody made some remark they should have made to that person. What do you do in that case? Because your code of conduct says nothing about that. Well, what you do is what most normal people would do. You know, talk it out with that other person, right? If somebody has offended you in some way, hey, email that person, you know, talk to that person. Uh, let them know that what they did made you feel uncomfortable or whatever it is and talk it through. Chances are, if you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with that other person, you guys are going to work that out very quickly because probably the person that offended you didn't even know they offended you. And when you tell them, hey, you know, what you said offended me, you know, I'm going to say, oh, I'm sorry about that. I didn't realize I wasn't trying to be offensive. I won't do that again, though, if it bothers you. End of discussion, right? There's no reason to make these things a bigger deal than they have to be. And I kind of like what the author gives as answers to some of the questions that some people in the community may have about something like this.
And that is it for this edition of Unfettered Freedom. This was Unfettered Freedom, Episode 11. I try to release a new edition of Unfettered Freedom every other week because this is a bi-weekly podcast, and bi-weekly means every two weeks. It doesn't mean twice a week. Nobody uses bi-weekly to mean twice a week. So you guys, quit emailing me asking me where all the other episodes of Unfettered Freedom are. All right? Now, before I go, I need to thank the producers of the show. I need to thank Michael, Gabe, Corbinian, Mitchell, Devin, Fran, Arch, 5530, Akami, Chuck, Claudio, Donnie, Dylan, George, Gregory, Kelly, Devils, Lewis, Paul, Scott, and Willie. These guys, they are the producers of the show. They're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. I also want to thank each and every one of these ladies and gentlemen as well, those of you watching the video podcast. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now. These are all my supporters over on Patreon because this podcast and the DistroTube channel is sponsored by you guys, the community. If you'd like to support my work, consider doing so. You'll find DT over on Patreon. All right, guys. Peace.